Now we're going to give just a very brief overview of some of the main issues associated with capital controls. Capital controls in general consist in limitations on capital flows and they take many different forms. For instance, under some capital controls you cannot remove your money from a country or you can only remove a certain amount. This is often the case today, for instance, in China. Capital controls also may limit the extent to which you can trade one currency against another, sometimes for the purposes of maintaining a fixed or pegged exchange rate. This was often the case during the early years of the Bretton Woods system. See our separate video on that. Capital controls also can be caps on asset purchases and sales when the money is crossing borders. For instance, in some cases, the Canadians have been unwilling to sell natural resource companies to Chinese investors. In other cases, a capital control may be what is called a minimum stay requirement, which is saying that any foreign money invested in a country has to stay there for a certain period of time. The nation of Chile did this to some extent in the 1990s. There are a variety of rationales for capital controls, and some of the reasons are simply political rather than economic. But the most significant case for capital controls today has to do with the danger of economies, typically developing economies, overheating in response to foreign capital flows. And here the potential problem is that foreign investors may become so enthusiastic about a country that they will send a lot of, that, a lot of their capital to that country very quickly. That economy will experience a boom. There will be much more investment and rising output. And it's possible that this process in some way becomes carried away and the investors become too optimistic and we then say this economy is overheating. The problem comes when foreign investors realize that maybe this developing economy isn't going to do so great after all. They then eventually pull out or contract these movements of capital. That may lead to what is sometimes called a sudden stop. See our separate video on that. And in general, there's the fear that free movements of capital under some circumstances can make economies more volatile and more prone to some kinds of financial crises. So the hope here is that some kind of capital control is imposed. This limits the initial upside potential of the economy by limiting the inflow of foreign capital, but it also means that the pain later on may be less severe, and the hope is that the capital controls can lead to less volatility and perhaps in the longer run higher economic growth as well. One positive example cited by proponents of capital controls has been the recent economic history of China. China has had more than a 30-year run of very high rates of economic growth and a pretty high degree of financial and economic stability. At the same time, the Chinese have had capital controls, they have had a deliberately pegged exchange rate, and they have made it difficult, varying in degrees at times, as to how easily you can take Chinese currency out of the country. On all these questions, see also our video on Chinese currency manipulation. Another positive example cited by advocates of capital controls has been the case of Malaysia in 1998 during the Asian financial crisis. Whereas some other economies such as South Korea, Indonesia, and Thailand were experiencing serious problems from a kind of whiplash from rapid movements of capital out of their countries, Malaysia in 1998 did impose some capital controls and it is argued that this slowed down their process of having some financial troubles. There are, however, some quite strong arguments against capital controls, and let's go through a few of these. The first, and perhaps most important, is simply that capital inflows from abroad spur economic growth and they boost investment and employment, and capital controls, usually to some degree, have to end up limiting these capital inflows whether they wish to or not. Keep in mind also that in general borrowing, whether by a nation's government or by its private sector, it can finance investment in education, infrastructure, and other assets which are going to help the process of economic development. We need to keep in mind also that capital controls will rarely be imposed in an ideal manner. Very often those controls lead to corruption. So if the law is saying in some way that you cannot take your capital out of the country, well, that's often easier said than done. What frequently happens is that the individuals who in some way wish to make a capital transaction, they bribe the bureaucracy, or the bureaucracy somehow controls the allocation of capital, and this corruption can be very bad for an economy.
A further point is that often these controls can be evaded. That is, you may put on paper that capital cannot be taken out of a country, but there are various ways using tricks of accounting or illegal transactions or how you invoice your exports where you can, in fact, get money out of the country anyway. It's very hard in the longer run to control movements of capital without also controlling trade in goods and services, and most economists agree that that is not a desirable thing to do. Finally, when you look at the history of when capital controls are actually imposed, the story that they're imposed to prevent overheating, that may be true in some cases, but it doesn't seem to be true generally. The argument has been made that often capital controls are imposed to postpone needed reforms, and therefore what we're getting is capital controls filtered through a highly imperfect process, rather than capital controls imposed may be the way economic theory would indicate. Overall, the opinion of economists on capital controls is very much split, with many economists in favor of them in some cases for developing economies, many economists against them. In the case of developed economies, most economists tend to be very much against capital controls. By the way, for more on these points and others, see our videos on foreign direct investment and also our video on Ann Kruger and rent seeking. If you'd like a clear example for the case against capital controls, consider the history of India. India removed a lot of its capital controls during its reforms of the early 1990s. It was only after this time that the Indian economy was really able to flourish and that India was really able to bring in enough inputs and bring in enough capital to help build a much stronger export sector, in this case in the services area. India did have some degree of financial stability before the capital controls were removed, but this came at the price of a fairly low rate of economic growth and fairly high rates of corruption, and very few people consider the case of India to be evidence for capital controls working well. It seems to be very much the opposite. There are many complex topics involved with capital controls, and of course no one video can even mention all of them, much less cover them with any thoroughness. For further reading, I very much recommend that you look at some of these pieces listed here. They are all online. They make cases for and against capital flows. I also recommend these pieces listed here, which are online. For yet further references, go to the Wikipedia page on capital controls, which is very useful and has many good references. And finally, for some background on our points about India, see our MRU video on India's reforms of the 1990s.